So when you have finally interpolated your contours for the model that you're building right now, ideally you would have something that looks like this, which is to say like you have a contour model with all the contour lines already projected at its elevation. Um, typically in plans you see contour drawings that um, are flat, right, like this, where the lines don't have any elevation associated with it. So this drawing here is not very useful in actual 3D modeling and GIS work because it doesn't have any Z value associated with it. When we start to want to bring this information into a program like GIS, we always want to make sure that the information already has a Z value associated with it. So this is where you would be at. I kind of set this up to be at the same scale as uh, the one you're working on right now. So a uh, uh, 60 foot by 120 foot uh, model, because you guys are working on one to 10 scale on a six foot or six inch by 12 inch base. So this is what you guys need to set up first um, before we do anything else like this, right? Are any questions about how? Okay, so what you want to do is when you're ready to do some analysis on this model here, you want to export this as a DWG. So at least in Rhino, you just go to File, Export Selected, and you go Export to DWG. In AutoCAD, you would just save as its own DWG file because it's already a DWG. Right? In this case, since I am using Rhino, I just select everything here, go to Export Selected, and I'll save it my desktop. So you want to save it as a DWG, right? I'll call this one Contour. DDOGs can save 3D information. Um, now, whenever you're exporting from a program like Rhino, you always want to make sure that you go to the options, uh, export options here. You always make sure that you're using a thing like polylines or natural. I like, I like 2007 natural the most, so I just use that as my export scheme. That basically means that it's going to export them as lines. Um, uh, solids you don't want to use because that's mainly for uh, meshes. And we're not, we don't have any meshes in this model, so we're just going to do 2007 natural. And then just do like that, and click OK. Save. It's going to ask you for again, just click OK. And then you're done. So then on your desktop, you have your DWG um, exported out. So this is a GIS, right? Um, Okay, so I will try to kind of go over kind of some very basic stuff about, stuff about this program. Really just the basic things that you need to know to accomplish this particular assignment. GIS is a really, really, really deep program. Um, I could teach an entire semester on GIS um, and show you a million things with it. Um, so but just for this class, I'm going to show you a few skills that you can use for this particular class. Now, the one thing I will note is that because uh, we are working within an abstract site, this is not actually cited at all anywhere in the world, it's just a model, we're not actually using GIS to its um, proper usage, which is to say like everything in GIS is always geolocated, which means that it's located somewhere on the earth and it's using a coordinate system so it knows where it is. Um, so. Because we're not uh, modeling anything in coordinate system, we're only using GIS purely for its functionality, which means just, you know, really it's just its tool sets. So this is not 100% the correct way to use GIS, but we're using some of the tools within GIS to do some analysis, right? So when you open GIS, this is what you see, right? Um, when we start a new project, I always go to my templates and I click on blank map. I just double click on that. And then basically we've created an environment in here that we can start to work in. So it's kind of like CAD in a way, kind of like Rhino. You have your layers, you have your uh, tool sets up here in this bar. You have a uh, sidebar here with a bunch of different tool sets. Whenever, whenever we start a new project, we always want to set a coordinate system first. And the way we do that is you just go to the table of contents here, right? And you double click on that to bring up the data frame properties. So this is kind of like manages all the things that you need to understand in terms of units. Uh, coordinate systems, rotations, uh, that kind of thing. 
So this is coordinate systems right here. And so this is where we would go essentially to set your coordinate system. Say you work in St. Louis, you work on this coordinate system right here. <coughs> now, because we are not working on a site, we don't have to set a coordinate system because it doesn't really mean anything for our project. This only applies to this particular project today or for this, this semester. So in further semesters, you would actually set a coordinate system for your projects. But for now, um, all you need to do really is uh, just make sure that, let me see, um, the units on your map here are set to feet right here. And I'm not sure why it's not letting me change it. Um, yeah, I mean, as long as this is set to feet, uh, you should be good because our units in here are set to feet as well. So with this set, we just click OK. And then what we need to do is just add the data to this map. So to add data to a GIS map, you have to use this little button here called Add Data, right here. So you click right there in that corner, Add Data. And you're going to want to make sure that you're connected to a folder that houses the data that you exported. And so in this case, this DWG here is saved on my desktop. So I'm going to want to add that desktop folder to this uh, list of folders here. I already have it set here, but I'll just remove it. Where I'll, just, I'll just add it again. Um, just click on this Connect to Folder button right here. And just click on your desktop. And click OK. And then since, since it's already added, but since it was already there, it's already gonna, it's already gonna be there, but it would add a new folder there. Um, so then here you can find this contour model DWG that we added. So you wanna double click into there and you can see all the elements of a DWG file, polyline, polygon, points, patch, annotation. This is just lines. So we just need to select the polyline option. So we click on add. Uh, ignore this. This just means it doesn't know where it is. It doesn't have a spatial reference, which is what we expected, right? Because we're not working within a coordinate system. <coughs> so you just click OK, and it adds it into this model here. So the, thing, the important thing about this model here that we need to note is that it has the Z values associated with it already. And the way we know that is by if we right click on the layer here, there's a thing called the attribute table. If you click on that, this gives us every single piece of data associated with each feature drawn in ArcMap. So it gives us the type of geometry it is. It gives us the layer that's on. So in this Rhino file here, these lines were drawn on the contour layer here. So it remembers that information. It remembers the color, the line type, but most importantly, it remembers the elevation, which is this line right here. So you see it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So this is why this line here is, is why we need to, in Rhino, set the elevations beforehand. Otherwise, all these would be 0, and then this, the whole process would be useless. It wouldn't do anything. So the next step of this process is we're going to take these contour lines here and we want to create what's known as a tin. A tin is just basically a triangulated mesh that uses the vertices of these contours uh, to create a three-dimensional uh, figure. So the easiest way to find the tool that you need to use to create a tin is to use the search command box. And so up here in this uh, toolbar up here, there's a thing called the search bar. If you click on that, it brings up this sidebar right here. And in the sidebar, I'm just going to type in TIN, T-I-N. It's going to bring up all the tools that deal with TIN management. Again, TIN is just a fancy word for topography, basically. So what we want to do is we want to create a TIN. And so if you scroll through the list here, there's a tool called uh, Create TIN right here. And it's part of the 3D Analyst tool sets. Now, before you do anything else, you always want to make sure that you have your 3D Analyst tool set enabled, otherwise this tool won't work. You're going to use the school computers probably, and I, I'm, I'm pretty sure all the school computers have all these tools already built in. But just to be safe, if, it's, if you click on this and it doesn't work, you just want to go to Customize, Extensions, and just make sure that 3D Analyst is checked. If it's not checked, then this won't work. So we're going to click on Create 10. Think about it for a second. And so it's going to bring up this dialog box here. So the only thing we really need to do is just take this 
information, this, this geometry here, and bring that, I'm just clicking and dragging it into this input features thing here. And then for the height field, we're gonna make sure that's set to elevation. If you remember the, the uh, attribute table had all the tables related to you know shape, color, that kind of thing. Elevation is the height field we wanna maintain. And then all you need to do is just click okay. You can all also set the location of this, but just to simplify this project, we're not gonna worry about any of this stuff here. You can also set a coordinate system, but again, since there is no location, this line means actually nothing for this particular project. So just click okay. Just give that a second. It's thinking about the thing. So we're going to turn this tin into a raster. So again, in the search component here, there is a tool called tin to raster right there. So again, I just searched for tin and I found it there. So tin to raster, this is going to turn this tin into a DEM. So I'm going to click on that. Again, it's part of the 3D analyst tool set. So I'm clicking on it. Clicked on it. There we go. I double clicked on it. And then what we're going to do is in the input tin line, we just drag in the tin here, like so. It's going to put it in an output raster here. Again, I'm not going to worry about this information for now for this class. In later classes, you will learn more about geo databases and how to save your information and that kind of thing. For this class, we're not, we're not, going, to worry too, not going to worry too much about that. Um, leave this line as is. Leave this line as is. In sampling distance here. This is how you determine your pixel density. So uh, cell size, this is the one I recommend using here. This basically means what is the resolution of your output DEM um, by the unit that this map is in. So right now it's in feet. So if this is set to one, that means the pixels, each pixel will be one foot by one foot. Generally speaking, you want to make this size small because then you have a more higher resolution DEM result, which gives you better uh, results when you do analysis and that kind of thing. So for now, let's just do 0.5, which was kind of the default. It was like 0.48 something before. Uh, Z factor, we're going to just leave as one. This comes into play later if, for instance, this tin is in a different unit say meters, right? In which case you want to apply the conversion factor. But because we know the units of this model here are in feet, and we want our raster to be in feet, we don't put any conversion factor onto it. So now the function is working here. So it's done. You see in the layer here, it's actually on the bottom of this, so we just turn that off, and then we turn that off, and this is our resulting DEM. So if I zoom into this image, you should be able to see all these pixels. Right? So each of those pixels is a number. And you can prove that if you just go to this thing here and you click um, this I button here. If you click anywhere, it, sees, it says gives you the pixel value right there. So you see, it gives you a different spot elevation. If I turn on you know, the contour lines here, for instance, if you pick a pixel value near that contour line, you'll see it's very close to the actual whole number of that contour. So this is, looks like it's the four contour. This looks like it's the three contour. So if you click on a pixel in between there, it should be like a three and a half uh, value here. So that's the power of a DUM, is just essentially a continuous grid of spot elevations. Um, a very useful tool. And if you start to do like things like 3D modeling and more fancier tools, uh, the, the DEM is your best friend. The, now, just as an aside, uh, the DEM can be visualized in different ways. If you double click on the layer itself, you can go to display options here, you can go to symbology, you can click on a different uh, number of color ramps to get like different color things happening on here, like maybe a nice simple red to green to illustrate high and low points. Um, I like this one here because uh, I think it's, it's a much nicer one. And uh, so that's one way to do it. You can also do classification. So if you click on classified here, I can actually break the, uh, the ranges of different colors into different areas like so. And so for instance, uh, if I go to 
let's just make seven classifications. If I go to classify, I can set break values between every single contour. So I say one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven, and then um, might need to add a few more actually. So let me see if I can add a few more. Let's make it like uh, 15. Sorry, bear with me for one sec. Okay, so I have set up these ranges here. So now you can see it now breaks it evenly into the actual contour interval themselves. So if I click OK and I turn on the contours, you see that they follow the, uh, the gradient nice and evenly. So something like this is very clean, a very clean aesthetic. The one last thing I might add as well as a way to visualize this differently is if you go in here, you see it looks it has that kind of pixely look to it, right? If you want to smooth that out, you go to display and click on either bilinear interpolation or cubic convolution. If you click on, I just use bilinear interpolation here. So just click on that, and that just basically takes the line and just kind of like smooths it out. Just does a little like calculation, just makes it, just kind of interpolates the, the, uh, the smooth line between it. So you can see you see this follows very closely with the actual contour grid itself. So it looks very nice. So uh, you asked a very good question. If you, could, if you have big DEM that you download from USGS, how do you clip it? Uh, you don't need to do this for this class, but it's a good tool to know. Um, you go to data and management here, go to raster, raster processing, and then there's a tool called clip. So in order to clip geometry, you're gonna need to have a clipping geometry to, to, to do, to use that. Um, Okay, so now that we have our DEM here, we can use this uh, raster here to do all the different analyses uh, that you need to do for this class. So we're going to start with uh, the, probably in my opinion, the most relevant one, which is uh, slope analysis. So slope analysis is found in the spatial analyst tools here. Again, if you don't know where to find it, you just go to the search uh, toolbar here and just type in the tool that you want. So in this case, it's slope. And so there's, there's two slopes here, slope 3D analyst and slope spatial analyst. So we want slope uh, spatial analyst right here. So I click on slope spatial analyst. So then all it's asking for is an input raster. So that's going to be this DEM that we created. Again, for the output, I'm just going to leave it as is. We don't, we're not going to worry about that for this class. And the output measurements, you have two options. You have degree and you have percent rise. Obviously, since we're taking a grading class, you want to use percent because that's everything is in percents, right? So you click on percents here, and then just click OK. So just let that think about it for a second. And then this is how you create uh, a slope map. So now from this diagram here, we kind of understand where the different slopes at these different break values right here are. And again, to change these break values, you can just double click in there, go to symbology, click on classify, and you can break it into different values. So Generally speaking, you want to use some, I would say, some standard uh, you know, break numbers. So 0 to 2, for instance, is your area that's a, areas that you would consider to be flat. Maybe 2 to 5 are areas that are walkable and don't need handrails. And maybe 5 to uh, 8 is another good break value. Then maybe 8 to um, 10, maybe 10 to 15, 20, 30, and then pretty much anything above 30 is considered steep. So we just click OK, apply. And I can see this is basically the result from that. Um, no worries. And then maybe I'll do a bottle interpolation to make it smooth out and maybe change the symbology to something a little bit nicer. So maybe like, uh, I don't know, something like this. So if we turn on the contours here, you can kind of begin to see how it plays out. So anything that's in either bluish or greenish here is considered flat up here or down here. Anything that's considered anything within this color range, 8 to 10, is that slope. And everything else is considered uh, 30 or above in terms of steepness. So this is a very useful diagram um, that you can use for site analysis, that kind of thing. Yes, Hillshade. 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 Whoops, I spelled it wrong. Hillshade. Hillshade is in 3D Analyst and Spatial Analyst. I think they're both the same. I'm going to use Spatial Analyst here. So you bring in your that raster. 
and just click OK. And there it is, health shade. So use. Change. I mean, that's basically like simulating projected sun angles, right? Yep. So can you change sun angles mm -hmm. here? Yeah. Um, if you go to Hillshade, you have the azimuth and altitude, these degrees here. So you can just change the numbers to kind of simulate different uh, sun, time, sun, uh, sun conditions. Uh, now, the one thing I will note is that uh, right now the default here, I actually think the default, even though it's actually uh, geographically inaccurate if you think about it, because the light does not, the sun doesn't shine from the north as it looks, as it appears in this particular image here, right? This graphically actually, though, reads uh, better on paper. Right, because on paper, if you're holding it in your hand, it's it's you're imagining like light casting from the ceiling down onto the model. So you can uh, make the the sun accurate to existing conditions using hill shade. Just be aware that it might look a little weird, actually, um, ironically. So, but yes, you can use this technique here to do everything that I showed you last class. So you put the contours on top of the hill shade. And then you make the hill shade and you make the transparency 50%. And that gives you that very, very uh, convincing uh, look of a contour mod where it's just really easy to kind of read the high points and low points and that kind of thing. Okay, so I will end that. Oh, wait, before I do that, sorry, uh, exporting. So uh, uh, to export this as an image that you can bring into Photoshop or uh, Anything else later, you want to go to the layout view, which is this super tiny button down here, layout view. And here you can set a paper size. So if you right click anywhere outside of this, go to page and print setup. And uh, it's going to bring up a thing. And uh, so you can set your paper size to be, say, um, you know, uh, ledger size. Maybe it's. Uh, if you check this box, you can actually customize it as well. Uh, the page and print sometimes is a little bit slow, but there we go. So you can do an 11 by 17. You can adjust this number here. Um, so just click OK. And actually, let's let's actually set it up to be this, the right scale. So um, so uh, the, mod, the drawings I set up for the assignment have everything in landscape view. So I'm just going to double click in here, the layer properties, and rotate in, this rota in the general tab for data frame properties and the rotation. I just type in 90 to do a 90 degree turn so that everything is, is oriented like that. And then in here, we'll simply set the scale to be one inch is 10 feet, right? So with this selected, you go to this uh, drop down menu here to set the scale. So we set one to 10. So now this is uh, the proper scale so that you can align it up with your images later. You can add scale bar if you want. So insert, if you go to this insert uh, option here, you can enter a scale bar. You have all these graphic options that you can choose from. Um, I recommend always choosing the simplest possible scale bar uh, that you can find because you don't want it to be distracting uh, to the actual design itself. So that will insert a scale bar. And then uh, all you need to do is just export that. Now, I recommend exporting this in two, 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 uh, files, one a vector file and one a raster file, and then just combining them into InDesign or Illustrator later because um, the rasters, raster files don't export well as uh, when you export to an AI file, so, so to speak. So this here, I would just say, just take off all anything that's like text or line work or that kind of thing. Don't turn on any contour lines yet. Um, just take this and export it. Go to File, Export Map. And I'll just save it to my desktop, and I'll just call this one Hill Shade, whatever. Um, you can save as a JPEG, you can save as a PNG, a TIFF, pick whatever you, you know you want. Uh, PNGs I like personally, and choose a resolution. 300 DPI is, is a very good resolution. And then click Save. And when it's done saving, just go to your desktop, and it's right there. Right. Very nice high res um, thing that you can overlay your contour lines on top of. So that's that. And then later, if then I would do this next, which, which is I would turn off all the raster data sets, turn on the contour data sets, then export this. Um, export as, actually one, thing, one other thing you can do as well is you can label these contours. Um, that's actually a good thing to do is if you label, if you click on the contour model and click on label features, you can actually add the, 
uh, a contour interval onto it. Now this isn't correct because it's not labeling the correct contour interval. So if I double click here, go to labels. Let's bring up this thing here real quick. You want the label field here to be the elevation. So click OK. And now it's actually the elevation. See, 1, 0, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, 10. So you can use this to quickly uh, uh, annotate your, your contour model. Um, and then there's also, there's, there's more complex labeling things you can mess with later, but I won't get into that. But when you have ready to export, you just go to File, Export Map. And then for vector information, I would just export it as an AI map. Click Save. And that's it.